Carl said at the beginning, we're certainly thankful for the presence of each and every one. On behalf of the members here, we are especially appreciative of those who are visiting in our assembly today. We welcome you and trust that you can participate with us in a way that would be beneficial to you and that God will be pleased. From time to time, it is necessary for a church to address the subject of authority and religion. There are several things that make that compelling. It's just important. <laughs> We've got to keep it in remembrance. At the same time, the world in which we live keeps changing and makes it more and more and more urgent. We're at a point in time today where once in a while someone will say, is, is there such a thing as authority in religion? As I look at religion today and see its confused and divided state and see how bad it is sometimes, is there any authority at all? In that. Well, we would certainly answer that question in the affirmative. There certainly is. And the fact that there is division, the fact that there is confusion, and all of those difficult things that make it so challenging sometimes does not negate authority. The authority is there, and we need to recognize it and remind ourselves from time to time, and that's what I hope to do with all of us together this morning. I will draw our attention again to the passage that Tim Deaver read earlier. This is the passage in the Gospel of Matthew that records this part of the ministry of Christ where he discusses this subject. We're not going to reread this passage, but only these two verses, verse 24 and 25. Remember, Jesus is in the final week. He's probably on Tuesday, just a few days before his death on the cross. He comes to the temple, I think this is the third time during this final week after his triumphal entry. And here are these Jews, these elite Jews, see and hear some things. They say, well, who does this guy think he is? We would say. And so they approach him. <laughs> And their question is, by what authority are you doing what you're doing? Who gave you this authority? Well, this is where we have the statement that you see on the screen, verses 24 and 25. Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which, if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority. I do these things. The baptism of John is from what source? From heaven or from men? <clears throat> we'll obviously be discussing this in more detail as we go along. But let's just simply note first that Jesus is the one that talks about authority and religion. He himself acknowledged that what he was doing was by authority. And we would say in his service uh, to God. So let's look at some things that we can learn immediately from this text. Some observations that we will make as we progress into our study and look at the verses, but especially applications. I hope that all of us together, individually and as a group, can apply the principles that Jesus teaches us about authority in his religion so that we can be more confident in our Christianity, in our service to God, and in our progressing toward that great judgment day. First of all, we learn in this passage what Jesus said that authority was. He used the term exousia, which is a term that literally means lawful or legal power. <coughs> and so it's a word that signifies a legal right to act. So when he's talking about authority and religion, and they're responding to them, he's talking about his lawful or legal right to do what he's doing. And that's really what authority is. And therefore, we must also observe. That means if we're acting with authority, we're doing what's legal. If we're acting without authority, 
we're doing what is illegal. And that's just as true in the law of Christ as it is in the law of the land. Whether they're talking about civil law, talking about any law, authority, anywhere, to act without authority is to act in a way against the law or illegally. And that's why this is important. Neither, none of us want to act in a way that God would regard our actions, our thoughts, our words as being unlawful, illegal, and we can use some other terms, but none of us want that. So let's consider what this means for us. Authority in matters that pertain to our service to God is relevant and compelling. Uh, it's not something we can just simply set aside or disregard, become indifferent about. And one reason for that is what the Apostle Paul said to the church at Colossae in chapter 3, verse 17. In a series of exhortations there, he said, And whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks through him to God the Father. What that language means and what Paul has said, he's not giving us permission to do whatever your heart desires and just simply say, I've done this in the name of Jesus. That's not the way that works in really any application. What he means is whatever we do as a Christian, whether it's what we say or what we do in action in our deeds, let's do that according to the say-so of Jesus in his name so that we can say what we have done is by his teaching, by his word, by his authority. So the point, authority in religion is something that has application to a collective action, to us as a church. We must act with authority in religion, but also from this passage, he's talking to you as an individual Christian. In whatever you do, do by the authority of Christ. There's something else we want to notice before we leave this chart, and that is authority in religion, as we learn from Jesus, has only two possible sources, broadly, generally speaking. And he made this statement in verse 25. When he responded to them and said, I'll answer your question if you answer mine. Now, I would feel compelled to make a comment on that. Well, sometimes people think the Lord is just evading the answer. He's just trying to sidestep their question. That's not true at all. Never would we think that of the Lord. And we don't. But he brings up the baptism of John. That, that seems to be an irrelevant, but it's not. Now we may think, if this is during the final week, it's been three and a half years since John was baptized. Three and a half years since this was a current topic of discussion, at least as it was happening. But the Lord sees this application. He said, I'm going to ask you a question. The baptism of John was from what source? What source of authority was John the Baptist baptizing? And he says, from heaven or from men? Now the point is, challenging them. They knew what they professed not to know. They went into agnosticism. But if they would say from heaven, he had borne witness to Jesus as the Messiah, as the Lord. If they had the wherewithal to identify the authority in John the Baptist, then they would also have the qualification to identify his authority. So this is the Lord's masterful way, as a masterful teacher, to bring to bear upon them their hypocrisy. So you, you folks aren't even being honest with yourselves. Because if you know the source of authority of John, then you know mine. So keep that in mind as you read this passage. The Lord is answering them directly in a way that he can be most helpful to them. And so let's notice this. There are, broadly speaking, according to the Lord, Two sources of authority in religion. One of them he identifies as heaven. The other he identifies as men. And those are easily recognized. 
We all recognize that. But I, what I want to do is to take opportunity to develop this a little further based upon this statement of the Lord in Matthew 21 and 25. Let's look at those two sources of authority and see how they come down to application in the religious world today and to your life as a Christian. So let's put them up there. This is going to be a graphic that uh, we develop as a visual aid for this. For the heaven, that's one source. Okay, I, I can understand that. But men, that of course identifies the other source as being human in nature. So one is from heaven, the other is from man. So let's develop how did authority, how does authority come from heaven to you? That's important. Because if we're going to act with authority in religion, it's got to come from the source to, to us. It's got to come from there to our practice and what we do. So how does that happen? Well, let's note first of all that the, the source, the ultimate source of all authority is God. But there is a, a hierarchy of delegated authority. We recognize that in the New Testament scripture. God gave authority to his son, Jesus Christ. And I would remind us of the statement the Lord made in giving the Great Commission, Matthew 18, or 28, verse 18. All authority, remember, probably the words have gone through you, has been given unto me. So Jesus simply affirmed that delegated authority from heaven, all of it, in heaven and on earth, had been given to him. But then he delegated authority. He delegated authority to the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 15, and 16, three familiar chapters, the night of his betrayal, between the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane, he gave this discourse to the apostles. And you remember, the essence of that is, I'm leaving you, I'm going to go back to heaven, but... In doing that, I'm going to give you another comforter, another one. He'll be just like me in helping you, standing by your side. And of course, John identifies that as the Holy Spirit. But the Lord said that he would function by bringing to your remembrance everything that I've taught you, and he will teach you all the truth. So the Lord delegated the authority to the apostles. The, apostle, the Holy Spirit, that is to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dedicated that authority to the apostles and prophets. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, as the Lord promised. And that represented the coming of that comforter that would guide the apostles into all the truth. The apostles were inspired by the Holy Spirit. They spoke by the Holy Spirit. They wrote down the scriptures by the Holy Spirit. In fact, they were so much a part of this process. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3 acknowledged that the apostles and prophets were the very foundation of the church with the Lord being the chief cornerstone. Well, how were the apostles, and this is New Testament prophets, by the way. Don't think about Old Testament prophets, but New Testament prophets. Men who spoke by inspiration, who wrote by inspiration, they were given authority by the Holy Spirit. But they delegated authority. How did the apostles and prophets? Well, it's already been indicated. They delegated that by writing down the word that was inspired. The authority is represented in that revealed word. So when we have your New Testament, I would encourage you to think about it in every way that makes it valuable and a treasure to us. There's a lot of things can be said about the New Testament. But one of the things that it is, it is the delegated authority from heaven. That authority from heaven that Jesus talked about is in your hand in the New Testament. It bears and possesses that authority in its entirety. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. The Holy Spirit inspired the apostles and prophets. 
and they wrote what you hold. Well, that's a hierarchy of delegated authority, we call it. It's revealed in the New Testament that way. Let's go to the other side. How does it work over here? How does the authority come to us from man? Well, that's a little more difficult. Um, and really, there's not necessarily an established hierarchy like there is for authority from heaven. But we can identify some that helps us understand because we see it happening. And it generally begins with a church, a religious group in the religious world, an organized religious body that is serving as a church, a denomination. Uh, they have their earthly headquarters, they have their boards of directors, and they oftentimes write and rewrite their doctrine, upgrade. In fact, we've had in recent times some very troublesome times in some of the churches in, in this, under this category because they are changing to adapt to the standards of the world, the acceptance of so many immoral things. How do we deal with that and maintain our membership and maintain our popularity and maintain our income, our finances? Well, we, we adapt, we change, and that has caused some serious problems in some of the churches. But why do we do what we do? Because our church made a law. The authority originates with the church, according to them. That's not so in the New Testament, but according to authority from men, it begins in the church. The church then puts it down in writing. We have creeds, creeds of human origin statements, writings, documents that express doctrinal positions that give distinctive identity to these churches according to their name. And this is what we teach, and this is what you as our body must believe. This is our creed, and it's the authority of this church. Well, those creeds turn into traditions, things that we do over, they do over periods of time to the point that they become traditional. And those traditions are sometimes say, why are you doing what you do? Are, are you sure that what you're doing is taught in the Bible? Well, not necessarily. I'm not concerned about that. I, I just feel it's right. My, my feeling is, based upon so much of our history, so much of our tradition, uh, in our creed, our religious organization, that I feel like it's right. And that's why we do what we do. So you look at that. Do we see that as a source of authority in religion that is human? It goes no further than man. It goes no further than a religious organization. And it, it's handed down most likely in this order, in this fashion. But I want to add something else. And that is at the bottom. What each of these means to you. When you have authority from heaven and you take your New Testament and you read what the Lord teaches you, God, through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, through the inspired writers of the New Testament, the apostles and prophets, and we do what we do because it is in the New Testament. And so, in one word, these things are assigned. It's what we were assigned to do. Why do we sing? Because we're assigned to sing. Why do we observe the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week? Because we were assigned to do that. To assign to do something means that we, we do that uh, as a matter of mandate. It was handed to us by an authoritative instruction that mandates we do that. So you see how that works. When we do what that authority teaches us to do, we are doing what is legal, what is lawful, according to the word of God. But what about this other side? It's quite different. What happens on the other side is, in one word, assumed. 
And what that means is taken for granted. Why do you do that? Is it in the Bible? Well, no, it's in our creed. Well, we, we just assume it's okay with God. We take it for granted that it's okay with Him because we're honest, we, we are sincere, we, we love God. But all of that is what we do is assumed. Not assigned, but assumed. And these are facts. So one person, as, as the Lord said, has to make a decision, and I would ask a question. What is the relationship between these two things? What is the relationship between what is assigned and what is assumed? Well, let me suggest one possibility. One possibility is they're used together joined together. Well, what we do, we use some scripture, we have Bible teaching, but we also use our creed. And so what we have then for our authority is a combination of authority from heaven and from men. So our question is, is that okay? Does God approve that? We better know for sure. Because this represents much, if not most, of what is done in the religious world today. Sometimes heaven's authority is completely ignored, dismissed, and go completely with men's authority, with our doctrine, with what feels good, with what is popular, with what will draw in the crowds, keep up the budget and the finances. But most of the time we have a union of what is assigned with what is assumed. But let's look at another possibility. This possibility is they're in conflict. No agreement. <laughs> no possible joining of the two. You either have to choose one or the other. Now which one of these scenarios do you think is biblical? Which one of these combinations of authority from men and heaven is the right one? Be honest. But if you're visiting with us and have not thought on these things, be honest in your answer with that. As you look upon authority and religion, what is your position on that? Well, I would suggest to you that the Lord helps us, if we go back to our text, and look at one little word. I have it circled. Jesus, when he asked this question, so this is the one question I want to ask you, scribes and Pharisees, Sadducees, you elite rulers of the Jews from the Sanhedrin who are questioning my authority. The baptism of John was from what source? Heaven or men, one or the other, either or, it can't be from both. And so the Lord is very straightforward on this, using language that you and I can understand. And when we understand this language, what he's telling us is that authority from heaven is not compatible with authority from men. What God authorizes us to do is either accepted completely and authority from men rejected, or we reject heaven's authority and accept the authority of men. What are we going to stake our eternal well-being, whether we go to heaven or go to hell, on? Are we going to do it on authority from heaven or authority from men? So what I have is just the recognition. It's the bottom line of what the Bible teaches, where we take our stand. This is where this church stands. And I call upon each and every one of us as members, as potential members, as well. This is where we are. We look upon the Bible. We look upon the New Testament, the law of Christ, as the relevant, applicable law for Christianity today. In fact, as we say at the top of this chart, it is the only legal source of authority in religion. It is the only one. There is no other. 
fact. That is true. Well, let's read some Bible that helps us be confident of this. That this is actually what the Bible teaches. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, and he, he was writing to them about certain problems that they were having. He said, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. That was the basis of the problem in Corinth. That was the re reason for those contentions and those divisions that were occurring in that local church. They were seeking superiority above others according to certain teachers. But be that as it may, what the Apostle Paul said, what you folks need to do is to learn a very important principle. You do not have the prerogative. You do not have the permission. You do not have the right to go beyond what is written. Or as the New American Standard Bible says, not to exceed. So you take what is written, then our attitude toward that is we cannot exceed, cannot go beyond what is written. So that teaches us, that brings us right back to the New Testament and what it assigns us to do, what it permits us to do, what it gives us legal right and power to do as the only source of authority in religion. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul uses two metaphors. One of them is as a soldier picturing you as a Christian, as a soldier. The other one is as an athlete. Right here in these two verses, or these two concepts. But the point is, he uses each one of those to teach us a valuable lesson. And one of them applies directly to what we're talking about. No soldier, he said, in active service, entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Now let me stop there. He's using the military. In fact, in 62 AD, the Roman military disciplined. He said there's no soldier in this Roman army who would ever allow themselves to be so entangled in life so entangled in civilian life to draw them away from the one that they're serving to please, their captain or whoever that officer may be. And that is easily applied to Christians. We as Christians should never allow ourselves to become so entangled in the affairs of everyday life that we don't have time to serve the Lord. And that happens. And we kind of tend to justify that. We think that's okay. But the Lord understands. You don't know if the Lord understands that. Because he didn't tell you that. We think we can come in town. Well, that's just the way life is. But you're supposed to manage your life as a Christian so that you do not do that. In fact, it's an explicit instruction in this passage. Now let's look at the second metaphor. Also, he said, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Or as the 1901 American Standard translates that lawfully, according to the law. This would be referring to the, uh, of course, in application to Christianity, the law of Christ. We have just witnessed, at least to some extent, an awareness of the parasol and and there were a few instances that called in question some rules and disqualification. You know, that kind of thing still exists in the athletic world. And be that as it may, we hope for reasons of justice that continues. But that's not our concern right here. Our concern is 
of Christian life. What does this teach us? What is this met metaphorical application of an athlete to you as a Christian teach you? You will not win. You will not be victorious. You will not be crowned with the crown of life unless you compete according to the rules. Now those rules are not just any rule. What Paul is telling Timothy, according to that gospel of Christ that you're preaching and teaching, that you heard from me, and that you're impressing upon the minds of the Christians in the church at Ephesus. So this is Paul's way of telling Timothy, Timothy, you've got to use only authority from heaven. That's the only kind of authority that is possible for us to have and go to heaven. Well, there's the end of the New Testament. You read all the way through the New Testament. You come to the end of the book of Revelation. If you read through the book of Revelation and get to that point. I say that because we all know the challenging nature of the figurative language of the book of Revelation. But we can understand this language. Jesus was saying to John, the apostle, he said, I testify unto you. And to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto them, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. That's a, a very sobering warning. It is to me, and I trust it is to you. This applies not only to the book of Revelation, it applies to the entire New Testament. It was God's principle even in the Old Testament. You don't take my word and change it. You don't take what I have revealed to you and add your things to it. You leave it as I revealed it to you. Well, we're living in an age, a modern age. We, we, we have all kinds of privileges. And it doesn't matter what we do anymore. We can do anything and everything. And there are no consequences. So let's just change the Bible to make it what we want it to be by adding our words, by adding our creed, by adding our regulations, our rules for daily life. Would anyone dare do that? A lot of people do. But here's the word, here's the promise. If you do that, then mark it down, that God shall add unto you the plagues that are written in this book, and we do not want that kind of destruction for any of us. But let's read the next verse. The next verse, you anticipate. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. Well, what about that? He's warned us not to add to them. But this is a warning. Neither do you take anything away from them. God shall take away his part from the tree of life. Now that's that's another way of saying, wow, if I, I have a part in the tree of life, you have a part in the tree of life if you're a faithful Christian. If they have that taken away, you know what that means? If your part in the tree of life is removed, you no longer have the tree of life. And that, in other words, eternal life in heaven. But what is it that can result in those kind of consequences? taking away from the Word of God, removing Scripture. And there are several ways that can be done. Perhaps you've heard this story of Martin Luther in the 1500s uh, he, as he was leading a Reformation movement. He, uh, he would often come on James chapter 2, verse 24. A man is justified by works and not by faith only. That was totally against what Martin Luther believed and practiced and taught. It is recorded in church history that he took a sharp knife and cut that out of his Bible. James chapter 2 verse 24 was not in his Bible because he cut it out. He said in his, a quote of him, that's a right straw statement. What he meant by that? I can't accept that and teach what I teach and believe what I believe. I've got to do something about this. So what I'm going to do is take it out of the Bible. 
we had a lady one time taking our correspondence course, and she had a quote, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 21, and the question was, what does the Bible say doth now save you? Well, everybody who knows 1 Peter 3, 21, the Apostle Peter says, which also after a true likeness, referring to that water of the flood that saved Noah by buoying the ark that he built above the drowning and destruction, which water, that is water, does now save you. And probably most everybody here who has read the Bible knows what the rest of the verse says, even baptism. So that verse says specifically, explicitly, straight out, that it is baptism that now saves us, along with faith, repentance, confession. We had a lady taking that correspondence course, and what she did, instead of answering it honestly, just took her pen and marked through the verse. She didn't cut it out, but she marked it out. She didn't want to read what that verse said. She didn't want to accept the truth. That was her way of dealing with truth. I'm going to remove it. Did she have the permission to do that? Was that a good thing for her to do? Uh, not according to what the Bible teaches. Not if she wanted to keep her part in the tree of life. So this is a warning that is very sober. That again, what is the overall, the only legal source of authority in religion? Matthew chapter 7, to go back to some of the personal teaching of Jesus, I like to refer to this one place. In Matthew 7, verse 21, the Lord has been warning about false teaching, that he wants his disciples to, to, to be careful about those who are false teachers. And he made the statement that not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will go to heaven. That's a principle he lays down. But then what he said in verse 22 and 23, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy by thy name, and by thy name cast out demons, and by thy name do many mighty works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. This is a judgment day scene pictured by Christ himself. And he's simply acknowledging on that great day there are going to be people who think they're going to heaven, who think they believe in me, who even call upon me as Lord, will not go to heaven. Why? Well, they said, but Lord, we've, we've done a lot of Great things for you. We, we have prophesied for you. We have done many mighty works for you. How can you not let us go to heaven? Well, look at what we have emphasized at the bottom. I don't know you. I don't identify with you. You call me Lord, but I don't know you <laughs> spiritually because you work iniquity. Well, we think that is synonymous with sin, but let me show you something. What that word iniquity is here, anomia, a negate law. Jesus used a word here, you folks who think you were going to heaven, but I'm not going to let you go because you negated law. In other words, you're lawless. You acted without law. You acted without authority. That's why it's important. If we ever allow ourselves to begin to think that authority in religion is nothing or not to be concerned about, we don't have to give our attention to it, then we need to raise our level of principle, wake up and start realizing with a full awareness and watchfulness the importance that Christ places upon us and the importance of it for you when you stand before him in the day of judgment. You do not want him to say this to you. Depart from me, you that work 
iniquity, or you who are lost, you who are have acted without. They did a lot of big things, a lot of religious things, and they claimed to be for Christ, but he said they were acting without authority. They were illegal. Well, one last question. Let's say that all of us at this point are asking this question. Most in this audience have already asked an answer, but let's go back and ask, what must I do to be saved? That statement is, question is actually asked in Acts 16.30. Go back and reference that in Philippi by the Philippian jailer. But what must I do to be, now let me ask you a question. Where do you want the answer to come from? Where do you want the answer for that question for you to come from? As important as it is to save you from going to hell and allow you to go to heaven, to deliver you unto the eternal home in heaven. What are you going to depend upon for the answer? Well, I think it is obvious, isn't it? You would want your answer to that question to come from heaven, from the authority in heaven. So let us note that. Let's know what that answer is. What is assigned, not what is assumed. We're not assuming anything here. There is no assumption here. Because when people ask, what must I do to be saved and go to heaven? We don't give an answer from the authority of men. We don't refer to creeds. We don't refer to traditions. We don't refer to our feelings. We refer to what is assigned in the scriptures into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Acts 3.19, the apostle Peter preaches that second sermon, repent ye therefore and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Confess. Paul talked about this to the Romans. We believe that he is Lord. And he promises salvation to those who do because it will lead to obedience in verse 10, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then finally, to be baptized for the remission of sins. I wish I had time to talk about some other things about this that I just this past week have run into some interesting things from the authority of man on this point. But enough said. What we want is what is a sign from heaven. And when you and I do what is a sign from heaven, that is in this delegated authority that originated with God and comes down to you and what you can read in your own New Testament, then this is the answer that is a sign to us. And that's where we put our trust in what we teach, what we stand for, what we encourage others to think about for the salvation of their soul. We want the salvation of everyone. We want your salvation. We want you to be saved to go to heaven, not to be lost. So when asked, what do I need to do? Well, a lot can be said to develop that. But the answer directly stated in these passages is exactly what we need to know. We have this invitation song that has been announced I trust this has been successful, that we can go forward into our life every day and be more mindful of authority in our service to Christ, in our religion, or when we're here as a collectivity in the assembly, that the things that we do are done by authority in religion. If we can help anyone in your obedience today to become a Christian or to make correction as an erring Christian, let us know. While together we stand and while we stand.